writers know everything. They know everything. They're really clever, very independent people, don't join groups. The loners, a bunch of loners, basically, writers, plodding away um, in a heartbreaking profession. <laughs> uh, writing their books. <laughs> yeah. That's a great description of writers. <laughs> Hello and welcome to The World As It Should Be, a podcast in which we ask our guests to tell us what they would change to help create their perfect world. By listening to what they'd like to change, we'll hear more about who they are, what they do and what inspires them. This podcast is brought to you by the team behind Prima Donna, a uniquely anarchic and joyous festival of everything creative. My name is Shona Abianka and I'm a book publicist working with some of the most thought-provoking authors writing today. I'm Catherine Riley, a writer and director of the festival. We're delighted to be your guides on this podcast adventure. The world as it should be from Prima Donna. Monique Roffey is a writer, activist and lecturer. She was born in Port of Spain, Trinidad and now shares her time between there and her home in London. Monique has published seven books, a memoir and six novels, as well as works of short fiction, essays and literary journalism. Her novel, The Mermaid of Black Conch, won the Costa Fiction Award and the Costa Book of the Year in 2020 and was shortlisted for the Goldsmiths Prize. It was shortlisted also for both the Rathbones Folio Award and the Republic of Consciousness Prize in 2021. Monique teaches creative writing at Manchester Metropolitan University, where she is currently a senior lecturer, and in 2019 helped set up Writers Rebel, a campaigning group inside Extinction Rebellion. Monique, welcome to the world as it should be, and welcome to 2022. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. I don't know about you, but I haven't quite got my head around it yet, no. that it's 2022. No. I, I wonder whether the last two years have been so sort of, you know, low level, high level horrifying mm. in so many ways that we've just slid them into one big mega year. Yes. Yeah. Definitely. And so it's just like, I can't, and, and it's just, and also the demarcation of sort of where we are now with the Omicron, mm. it's like, there's not that much to celebrate. We haven't really got clear of this. So yeah. I'm in denial somewhere in my unconscious. I haven't really thought to myself oh new year new no, new and year yeah I agree I think we're also starting to think I always think, think back to March when the pandemic kind of really started in mm. earnest and we all heard about it for me that's like the beginning now of something of that year so it's all been thrown well, interestingly into- I I've been looking at the timeline and mm. March was when it sort of was coming for us it was like in Italy and coming our way but it was this time last year exactly early Jan when it was the news of it was first coming out of Wuhan. Yeah. Right. You know, it's it's, it's yeah. two years old now, this thing. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. Yeah. And, and the initial, um, I don't, what's the word, panic and, and kind of adrenaline that came with it in 2020 just gave way last year to just the most draggy, crappy year. <laughs> yeah. And so that ending doesn't feel like there's much. Anyway, this is a miserable start to a podcast, yeah. isn't it? <laughs> Let's so so sorry. I started it. I started it. <laughs> Happy New Year. Anyway, yeah. Um, where are you, Monique, right now? What are you up to? What are you writing? What are you working oh on? Oh, God. Um, I'm actually in, I live mostly in the East End of London. Um, before COVID, um, I used to travel around a lot. Mm. And before I was a cat owner. So I used to spend a lot more time in Trinidad as well. And I teach in Manchester. So I was always running around. But I have been very, very based in um, my land for a couple of years. Um, I'm writing another novel um, for to be delivered in June. Um, I've got so much time now these days because mm. uh, I've got a year off. I've been given a sabbatical from Manchester Met Amazing. that I'm really surprised myself that, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm halfway through a first draft of a novel um, I have lots of other things that seem to sort of be juggling. Um, oh, I'm I'm judging the Orwell Prize for political fiction. Oh, wow. That's a great And prize. I seem to be doing quite a few other things as well, organising another rebellion for Writers' Rebel for April. Cool. Um, we're hoping to collaborate with some very exciting partners for that. So there's always something, always lots going on. You yeah. can't divulge any of those names yet, can you? I can't know. I can't. The, the the action certainly not top secret, but uh, and it's the novel is called The Harrowing, and it's um, what is it? It is a sort of Caribbean noir meets a kind of um, protest novel, a feminist uprising protest novel. Um, 
I think I thought I had a really good idea of what I was doing before I started. And then, of course, the creative process starts to take hold. And then the process also has its own ideas and starts to tell me mm. what I'm doing as well. So it's still quite early days with it, but it feels exciting. And was it a one of those ideas that came out of when we were all in lockdown the first time around? Or was it brewing way before? Brewing. Brewing for years. In the same way the Mermaid of Black Conch had been brewing for many years. Um, it's based on a murder that happened about five years ago. So it's been brewing for about five years since this murder happened. Um, I don't think I'm going to say too much more about it okay. because obviously it's um, that thing that you give it away and you speak too much about something before it's yes. published, then it's less likely um, to get written. Okay, so, so it's based um, on a true murder. Yeah, on- it has its genesis in a, in a true story, yeah. Can't and do you still have your, is it a chalkboard or, or, or a blackboard or something in front of your desk where you... Would you like your- to see it? Would I'd like, like to see- yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'll describe it for the viewers at home. <laughs> I'll... Um, yeah, I've been using this method. Or I think I've just uh, been using this method for years. Oh, wow, brilliant. Thing. Oh, that's so cool. It's that's just a, It's cool. just a big cork board. I stole this idea from Hilary Mantel, <laughs> hook, line and sinker, except she doesn't use a board, she uses a folder. Right. And, um, and I do a lot of research before I start anything. Um, I never start anything without mm. some lots of planning and thinking and research so that was a lot so, of images it, mm. it was was it as well as as mm. more than words is that is that fair to say so is it, do you um, sit and think well about- the other thing that i've done let me have a look is for this novel and for the last novel but not mermaid mm. i've written a treatment right like for a film so okay. i've got like a yeah i've got a sort of good chunky treatment here Okay. And, and what's interesting is this is quite an advanced pro- uh, process because I'm, I'm a great planner before I write, but this is the first time I've written a proper treatment and I was writing a crime novel as well. I've, ri- I've also written a crime novel. That's another story. Mm-hmm. And I wrote a treatment for that at the um, advice of a friend of mine who is a screenwriter because it's just, that was genre fiction. And I thought, okay, I'll try this treatment for this. And what's been really interesting is it's given me a huge amount of confidence because mm. I have literally, you know, put so much into the treatment. But as I'm writing my book, you know, it doesn't look anything like the treatment. You know? <laughs> <laughs> the treatment is another, it's a whole, yeah, there's ideas that's going into the novel, but mm. I still find the creative process extremely trickster-like. Right. Can you define treatment? Because I'm not sure that everyone is going to know. Well, um, it's a definitely something I've borrowed from the screenwriting world. And I, so screenwriters don't just sit down and bash out a script. They write their treatment. So they'll write a treatment of the script. Sometimes it's called a Bible um, or they have a Bible and a treatment or something like this so that they get the story down and they do a lot. I also do a lot of character work, um, which would be something a screenwriter would do as well. So I have small little portfolios on every character that I've been... Because, I, you see, I think you've got to be really careful because I obviously know lots of interesting people. I know lots of interesting people in the Caribbean. And you have to be really careful that they walk straight into your work, yeah. um, which has got all kinds of ethical, pro- ethical problems, yeah. you know. So often I am inspired um, either by historical events and real-life people um, but they can't be these people. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I've got I've managed to put about three or four different prime ministers into my novels, and I think at least one of them was dead. Another one would never read my book, you know. But the current <laughs> prime minister and his wife, they're a bit like Barack Obama and uh, Michelle Obama. They definitely model themselves, and I've got to be really careful to make sure that my characters are very different. Yeah. So I do a lot of work on constructing fictional characters that I can call my own. Mm. Yeah. They're mine. There's so much rigour in that, in what you're describing. And and I assume, uh, you know, one of the things, one of the many strings to your bow is your teaching, your creative writing, writing, Mm. writing, teaching. Is that, 
Would you recommend this? You know, some of our listeners are writers or aspiring writers. Is this is this a good practice? Is it just your practice? You know, I think we've spoken to both Adele Parks and Dorothy Coombson, both mm-hmm. writers that have said they find themselves describing exactly as you've just said, describing people that they know in real life, sometimes on purpose, <laughs> in yeah. the characters that they're depicting. So, yeah, how, is this a kind of top tip well, for I people? Would, well, I would try to not to do that. I mean, it's really careful. As I've gotten older and more wiser, there's definitely been tiny cameos in my book that have been people, and they've never recognised themselves. Wow. Right. Um, tiny things have gone into my books, but I've tried to be really careful and then you always get people saying, oh, don't write about me, don't write about me. Like, I wouldn't write about you in a million years. <laughs> you know? And no. they're really saying, please write about me. <laughs> but getting back to it, I this is my process and I do teach by process. Right. I also say to aspiring uh, writers, never sit at the foot of one teacher. Right. Because I have such strong, I have such strong Um, biases and working methods and ideas about composing or putting my work together and putting things together that, you know, whoever wanted to come and learn from me, I always say to them, please, you know, go and go and listen to or work with like several creative writing teachers Mm. and take whatever is good for you. You know, my process isn't the only process. It's not the process. It's my process. It's a bloody good one. Um, and I can really rely on it myself, yeah. but I don't think that any, you can't sell one thing to everyone. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And is yeah. that the same thing that you teach your students is to use their own, whatever works for them? Yeah. I think every, it's like climbing a very big mountain. You've got to find your way up. You know, there are certain, there are certain things that like will, will work for everybody, but not everybody, you know, you've got to find your way yeah. up and then work and then try to remember how you did it. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, should we um, let's talk? Let's start to talk about your three things for creating the world as it should be, and we can pass part of that. I'm sure we'll talk about a bit more about XR and various different things. So, do you want to start us off with your first change? Okay, so my first change is I would love. I'm a I'm a Buddhist, and at the core of Buddhism is this idea, this word metta, which means loving kindness. And um, it's actually at the core of all religions, which is um, compassion, um, compassionate awareness. Um, And it's something that I think can be taught. Um, There are various um, meditations. There's one that we do in Tri Ratna, which is the order I belong to, and it's called the Metabhavana. And Metabhavana is something, it's a meditation in five parts. And part one is you bring love and compassion to yourself. Um, I think part two is you bring love and compassion to somebody you care for, a friend. Part three is bringing love and compassion to somebody you find quite neutral. Part four is loving kindness to an enemy. Right. To somebody who's hurt you very badly. And which I think is a superhuman, very advanced humanity. Mm. So the last is you bring them all together. And and I just think this is something that is a practice that has really revolutionized the way I write, live, um, think about things. You know, I, I sort of f- find myself these days feeling quite ashamed of myself when I get angry, <laughs> you know, and want to sort of hurt somebody or put them down or put them in their mm. place or... These are not good. <laughs> these are these are in Buddhist terms, it'd be like wrong views, wrong actions. And so my first um thing would be to revolutionize, I, I would say, global thinking, maybe even at the highest level, um, where meditation, meta, um, values around love, loving kindness, cultivating an awareness that is compassionate would be something I would want to go global. Mm. And also, you know, teach everywhere, teach in prisons, teach children and train trainers, you know, train people to do this as well. It's not sort of free love in the hippie sense. It's a, it's a spiritual um, friendship. It's, it's, it's a means of friendship. Mm. It's a means of um, connecting to people. Um, and it's also a tone. I mean, you know, you can actually, like I dislike, I, I absolutely dislike and despise Donald Trump, but I'm not going to. I'm not going to mock 17 million people who voted for him. 
Right. Okay. We need a better way through this. Yeah. But do yeah. you feel it's human nature and you're allowed to feel frustrated or angry, but yeah. it's how you react or how you deal with that feeling that has changed in you? Yeah, of course I still feel it. Mm. But acting on it and also one of the Buddhist precepts is about speech, is about being careful what you mm. say. So s- skillful speech is also, you know, a great skill and it's part of this whole concept of being able to respect somebody else's views even if you absolutely find these views abhorrent mm-hmm. um so was there a trigger for you looking into buddhism and realizing that actually you wanted to learn more um no uh, it's a long story with buddhism i it's been te- a 10 year journey to be honest and um i was born roman catholic and i walked into a buddhist center in bethnal green very near where i live now I decided I wanted to learn how to meditate. And and I, I then started going regularly and I went to Dharma Night on a Monday night for like years, years and years. And I used to sit there and I I have hearing a hearing problem, so I used to sit in the front row right in front of the person who was giving the Dharma. And um and I always thought to myself, Well, I I like these Buddhists, um, and I get what they're saying, and this is all great. But I'm a Catholic, and you can't decatholicize yourself. You're kind of, um, you know, the hard drive has been, ta- you know, I've got mm. it, I've been tampered with. Mm. You know, you, you get baptized before you can speak kind of thing. So, well, long before you, you know, in the first week of your life sometimes. So I always thought to myself, I'm trapped inside my Catholicism and also inside dualistic thinking uh, dualistic judgments, heaven and hell, God being a man, good and bad, time. Mm. But gradually, over a very long period of time, it began to fall off. It, all these ideas began to fall away. And the hardest thing I think that has begun to fall away is falling away is the notion of God, that there is a God. So it's been a very long process. Mm. And I think it's been a sort of full full conversion, yeah. Mm. Did you feel guilty for kind of deciding? She's, she's a former Catholic, of course she did. <laughs> yeah, it's been a big struggle, yeah. it's a big yeah. struggle. Um, can you live a, a life without God? Um, I sometimes, I know there are lots of people who don't believe in God. I know there are lots of people who live a secular life. Um, I'm not one of them, but yeah. I wonder about living without God or having any spiritual practice. Don't know. Wouldn't want to judge. Um, so, uh, do you have to like meditation? I find it, I find it personally mm. really hard to meditate to clear really? my mind to do all the things mm. that you're you know that are, you know are good for you and that are feeding into this better better mental health and, and better ways of being towards one another. How did you like? How do you train yourself to do that? To turn off the noise and to so of- we have this what Buddhists call prapanka, which is the MTV in your head. Which is like, it's like yabba 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 yabba, mm. and um, you can train yourself. Mm. How do you start? You go and do lessons to begin with. Find somewhere like a Buddhist center that will teach you, and then you keep trying. I'm not the best meditator in the world, but I have to say that um, slowing things down and paying attention to your body, your breath. Um, you know, it's not rocket science, and I'm not the only person to mm. ever say this. But if I had one thing. I could do tomorrow to change the world, it would be to send this global, to send loving kindness as an awareness, as a spiritual practice, a practice Mm. of communication and friendship and friendship building. Obviously, that is an intrinsically sensible, it seems to me, way to create a more perfect world. Um, Mm. So, yeah, thank you for that. Let's move on to your your second choice. Which is for everybody to go carbon neutral tomorrow. Right away, overnight. Yeah, I would like that. (laughs) <laughs> not too much to ask is it that seems very straightforward yeah. <laughs> why not if you want you know, why not ask for everything what you really want well this I mean, is the whole point of the podcast yeah think big so um i'm just reading jesse greengrass's the high house it's very very good book set in the maybe in the next 20 30 40 years um novel it's a novel very well written about what it might look like in 20 to 40 years. And so at 56, I, um, I've i lived 56 years with um, reliable weather, generally, generally reliable. 
although we've been seeing for the last 10 things changing mm. and now we have a pandemic. Um, and But towards the end of my life, I'm going to see the thing that we're all talking about, mm. the climate scientists and activists. And so are you, we all are, but no one... There is a big problem with fossil fuels. So like 90 companies have been fucking the world up for about 150 years, not just the last 30. And it's convincing them to uh, go green and uh, to change their method of producing energy, to stop digging, stop drilling, stop fracking, etc. Um that's very big, very, very big. I mean, COP26, you know, they're only just beginning to mumble about this mm. because it feels like it's impossible because there's so much power and money um, wrapped up in it. And also when we think of um, big oil, we think of Shell, ExxonMobil, BP, blah, blah, blah. But those are private companies. They only produce 6% of the oil that we're talking about. The problem is um, OPEC, they're like a, a cartel of oil producing states. And then there's giants like Russia and China that are not in OPEC. I mean, how do you convince countries to stop producing something that's making them all the money to support all their people? It's horrible. It's a terrible conundrum we're in. We have only got 10 years before before we have big problems. And the problems that we are facing, Jesse Greengrass in the High House is writing about exquisitely. So what? tell us about your work with Writers Rebel and co-founding that and, and what, what you're doing. You know, I, I think it's easy for people to feel like they don't know what to do or that, you know, they can't ever do enough because the problem is so huge. So, you know, as a writer, particularly people in the arts can often be you know, <laughs> not feel that they have the, the the kind of tools to kind of engage with big world problems like this. So can you tell us about what you've been doing and, and where you're going next with that? Well, um, Writers Rebel was formed during the rebellions of 2019. Um, myself and a small group of writers were sort of all tweeting, tweeting about this, saying, you know, what can writers do? What can writers do? Um, a few of us got together and we were floundering around initially about what we were going to do, what we were going to do. And then we met somebody who's embedded in Extinction Rebellion, who's also a writer. And that was it, really. It was mm. a very happy marriage between mm. us and them because um, they're so sure of themselves and they've grown out of the Occupy movement. They really know what they're doing. Um, and they still do to Mike's. They still get my vote. So we... Um, committed to their manifesto and we committed to disruptive non-violent action um, but the thing we do is to try and galvanize a notoriously difficult um, community of people people who tend to do their activism at home on their mm. computer who don't tend to leave the house and also writers are famously really unclubbable um, they don't join groups um and they're big know-it-alls. Writers know everything. They know everything. They're really clever, very independent people, don't join groups. The loners, a bunch of loners, basically, writers, plodding away um, in a heartbreaking profession, uh, <laughs> writing their books. <laughs> yeah. That's a great description of writers. <laughs> I've been doing this for 20 years. You know, it's a heartbreaking profession. <laughs> and most writers are not making any money, you know, something like less than 10000 a year from their writing. So it's very hard to galvanise this kind of um, potentially radical um, community. So we have been holding um, events to raise awareness and to uh, bring who we are to a wider, you know, to say to people, we are here, we are, we are active, we get it, uh, join us, and to join in to the rebellion. We've held, well, our first action was in, October of 2019, before the pandemic, where we got 40 writers together and we held it in Trafalgar Square in this kind of chaotic environment. We managed to program 40 writers in like two weeks and at least half of these, the very big names, also activists, other people who were environmental writers, um, 
Well, there was some really, f- I don't want to name any names, but I have to say there was one writer in particular who was hugely famous and very um, uh, private. It's very hard to get hold of her. And she doesn't, she's not on social media. It's very hard to get hold of. And I sent her an email and said, please, will you come and be part of this? And she just said, sure, where, where and when? Mm, and yeah. she just got on the train and, and I, you know, and she was amazingly mm. brilliant, got people singing, you know, I was just like, oh, fuck, thank you. Um, <laughs> I will, I will drop a name. A.L. Kennedy was mm. incredible. Excellent. Um, we asked her to compare half, half of it because um, this, this thing went on for five hours. And, and she's also a stand-up comedian. She's just this kind of person who can be strong, you know, mm. in the chaos. And she just held it together. Mm. So this is something, you know, activism is also free, you know, so trying to get writers to be active and give of their, of their time and positionality and everything for free is challenging. Um, we've done actions online during the pandemic. We did something called Insectageddon about the fact that insects are vanishing. Um, we did something called On the Brink of Extinction about animals that are disappearing. Um, we did a big thing in Tufton Street in London where all the right-wing think tanks are. And this, this, is, our, this is where three of our members got, uh, got arrested and uh, faced charges for criminal damage. Um, and we have also been doing this thing called Paint the Land as well as Paint the Streets. So we floated a big carpet on the Thames outside the Tate last summer with Ben Ockrey and Damon Albarn came on board and Ackroyd and Harvey, these fantastic Brilliant. artists who work with with um, uh, grass. They grew a message in grass and floated it on the Thames. So we've done, I also did something with Zach Ove, um, the Trinidadian British artist, and he, he, he and his team designed us some posters and we fly posted them in like, thousands and thousands all over many cities during COP. So we are 10 people who um, do this for free and we galvanise other writers to um, get active and um, join Beautiful. us. So it's yeah. been it's been <laughs> a real labour of love. That's but quite incredible. again, you know, going back to what I would like to do is we need to really start getting active around. Yeah. So you you describe yourself as binational. You spend time here and in Trinidad. What you you said at the beginning of this conversation about the the changing climate, changing weather. You know what what that weather will look like in ten years, twenty years time. What do you notice already? differences uh about here you know here in in the uk and and in trinidad and can you yeah um it's much hotter trinidad's get the problem right. with the caribbean is going to get too hot so you're going to have people leaving you're going to have mass migration from the caribbean or anywhere near the equator mm. people are going to have to leave it's already very 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 hot there but we're seeing like the president the prime minister of barbados mia motley she has been very active in the yeah. un she came to cop um, Barbados is an island that gets hit by hurricanes regularly. It's completely flat and they rely on tourism and they have rising sea levels. Um, and like, like us, um, like everywhere in the Caribbean, um, our coral reefs have died. They're dying. Um, uh, I don't know if you know anything about lionfish, the lionfish that this has been an ongoing problem for about 15 years. The only thing I know about lionfish is that I m- mistakenly turned on the masked singer this week and there was a lion- <laughs> lionfish performing. So this that's my low key reference to what you're describing. That's just, that's okay, just- so this is actually an environmental catastrophe. So um, it was a hurricane again. It might have been Hurricane Andrew that swept through the States and there were some lionfish. It might have been in Miami or somewhere like this up further up. And there was some lionfish in a tank, about nine or ten lionfish, and the tank broke. <gasps> and the lionfish, which are not indigenous to the Caribbean, fell into the sea, and they breed like crazy, oh and God. they eat everything. They're incredibly oh. aggressive. And when I say eat, they open their mouth, and they just suck. They're like hoovers. They just suck, um, like, you know, when fish are born, there are thousands of them, yeah. and they're tiny. They just suck it in. Yeah. They just eat everything. Wow. And they've decimated, um, like I think in the Bahamas, there used to be like, you know, 50, 60 different types of fish. And now there's like four, right. four types of fish. And they're everywhere. And they're really hard. They're really aggressive. Mm. And people now spear them and kill them and eat them. But that's just one story. I, yeah. I wrote a novel called Archipelago um, about, 
not about lionfish, but literally about what's going on in the Caribbean. So it's it's tourists, it's boat people, it's climate change, it's global heating, it's too hot. Mm. Yeah, that's it's yeah, I see it. Yeah, I definitely see it. When mm. I was younger, um I used to go to Tobago and, you know, it was empty and you mm. could the tide went out and you would see conch or conch mm. as we say studying the sand you know you mm. would see coral you could see you, it was amazing yeah that's all gone mm. yeah how difficult is for you is is it for In you as lifetime, well to, to you know, balance 20, 30 years yeah but to, for, for you to be kind of between two places that you have to have to be connected by an airplane flight that's that's also that's a bit of a trauma that's like an individual well kind that's of- gonna go that will go that will go eventually. I won't be flying. Right. I mean, I think air travel is going to become something that m- the generation, people who've got children who are like 10 now, when they are our age or, you know, as they're growing up, it'll be less and less cool to travel. Mm. You won't talk about flying anywhere. It'd be very expensive to fly and you just wouldn't do it. It's going to become something that people won't do. Yeah. And I can see that happening in my lifetime in the next 10 years. I just won't fly. Or it'll become something for the elite, yeah. Would you, yeah. I mean, if there was no climate change, for example, would you consider moving to Trinidad? Would you ever retire there or no. live there? No. no, too problematic, too many problems. Um, it's the only place on earth that I call home, home, where people have known me and my family, my parents. Mm. People stop me in the street. People see me. I bump you every time you, you get in the car and drive around, you bump into people you know. Mm. People hoot their horn, they wave, that people, you know, you know, people know you and you know them. And it's so it's home, it's like a big village, a port of Spain. But I can't go and live there now. Mm. It's terrible, terribly corrupt, very yeah. dangerous. Right. The day to day would be tough. Yeah. 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 Okay, so um, how you you've kind of linked a solution to both of these yeah these problems do you want to yeah billionaires um, billionaires there you go <laughs> so your third so and final change my third and final choice is that um we really need because there are people there are individuals and there are companies um on the planet who are have more wealth than governments they are people who have more money than the, than the bank of germany i'm sure yeah. You know, they've got, there are people, individuals on the planet who have more than the GDP or the, how more gold than, you know, a rich country has in its bank. So um, these people need to be brought to, to into accountability. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm not sort of saying you've got to ban billionaires, but why do we need, why do they need billions? Yeah, no you know, one needs Who billions. are these people? Rupert Murdoch, um, Bill Gates. I mean, Bill Gates, I I don't know if it is it, it's official that he's a bad person. I mean, he's a progressive philanthropist as far mm. as I can see. And there is a big progressive philanthropic community in the world. There's just a bigger conservative philanthropic community. So we need progressive philanthropy and we need billionaires to be halving their wealth at least and pouring this um, asset, this wealth, into a carbon neutral endeavour globally. You know, we need to sort of like literally go to these 1,000, 2,000 people, the world's wealthiest, and say, we are opening up an account and you all have to put a billion in there. Mm. That'd be fantastic. And what we're going to do with this money is we're going to go carbon neutral. It's mm. going to be called the Green World Bank account, and you all have to put a billion in. Mm. Well, I guess that goes That's back to my, your first and then, point. That, then, then it pays we, for everything. If mm. we spread That's kindness we, and everyone meditated, perhaps that yeah. would be one of the offshoots. Yeah. What do you think? Do you think there's a role, or not a role? Do you think there's a uh, that gender comes into play? You know, you just described these uh, sort of Bill Gates and other kind of philanthropists. There's there was an article today in the in a paper about Jeff Bezos's ex wife and the the money the money that she has given yeah. to philanthropic causes versus him going into space for four minutes. Uh-huh. Do we should we just take the billions off the men and give it to the women and see if they can sort it out? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, I, I thought you might say no. I was just that. checking. I don't think so. I think we just need to go to the people. They usually, they will be men, though, um, mostly yeah. who have 
this kind of power and wealth. It's interesting. I've been. Have you been watching Succession? I haven't watched the new season yet, but I've I've watched season one and two. Okay, you've excellent. got to watch it, and then also watch the BBC. It's on iPlayer um, documentary on Murdoch because huh. um, in real life, Murdoch's two of his children have like gone their separate ways, long walked away from their father. But most recently, James Murdoch, who is, um, again, probably one of the wealthiest men in the world, he is married to a climate change activist. And he has set himself up as a progressive philanthropist, is giving lots of money away to left-wing political uh, groups. And um, Murdoch obviously owns the Australian and all the Australian press, And, you know, they've had these terrible fires and the Australian press have been anti-climate change. And uh, even though they've had all these terrible fires. And I think recently, as last year, James Murdoch, he kind of basically denounced his father. Um, Murdoch himself, find him online. He was interviewed once. And he said, look, you know, you're just talking about 3% uh, warming in 100 years. That's nothing, (laughs) you know, Mm. which is like, ah, and (laughs) that is what Donald Trump thinks. That is what Mm. stupid people think. It's just 3% in 100 (laughs) years. You know, I'll be dead. Who cares? Who gives a fuck? Um, So he has actually gone against his father and so have suddenly the Australian press. So, you know, we are seeing cracks and... At the same time, James Murdoch has also bought himself a massive ranch up in the Canadian Rockies. You know, for when for when climate change happens, he'll be fine. He's, he's got his he's got his homestead up there, which is what all these rich people are doing. You know, in Washington, they are talking about uh, climate change, but the rich will inherit the earth if we're not careful. They'll all be fine. What a terrible earth if those people are the breeders, though. Good lord. Do you think we can stop it? Is it any? Is there anything? that can stop this though. Yeah, there is. We haven't, it's not the end. I mean, I've got a lodger who lives with me. She's only 22 and she's like, I don't see why she's, she said, we're doomed. We're doomed. And I said, we're not doomed yet. We're not doomed yet. We can stop this. We can definitely, definitely do something about it in 10 years time. If we haven't done anything yeah, then we're fucked. Right. Then you may as well, I don't know, do what you like. You know, I don't think it's great for people to be, to have missed this space, has missed this gap of a decade. And in 10 years' time, if you were to interview me, we would be talking very differently. You wouldn't even be asking me about this. Mm-hmm. It would be yeah. like, we're fucked. Why didn't we? I mean, if you'd watched Don't Look Up. Yeah, there's I was some, just thinking about that. At the end, at the end DiCaprio says, um, well, I mean, we did everything we could, didn't we? And apparently that line was ad-libbed. It was him saying this because... He is a liberal pro- mm. philanthropist. He set up his foundation when he was 24. He's been doing this for years, decades. He's given 80 million of his millions away. Um, he knows what he's talking about. And, you know, have we done everything that we could? Have you, you know, have we all done everything that we could? Mm. Um, is uh, what we're all going to be asking ourselves in 10 years' time. Mm. And that's the perfect takeaway from your three things, actually. Are we are, are we all doing the best that we can? Yeah. Thank you, Monique. That's a brilliant way to end the conversation. Yeah. And thank you for your time today. Thank you so thank much. You. And good luck with the book. I can't wait to read it. Thank you. We'll see. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. as it should be from Prima Donna.